Welcome to my continuing series on faith-based decisions. We have been trekking through an exhaustive study, a literal deep dive into all aspects of prayer. We have been working our way through one verse, Ephesians 6.18, for the last 32 weeks. Thank you for viewing. Today we are starting our third lesson on the biblical concept of praying with all perseverance, and the reason that we pray with all perseverance. In the last lesson, we learned that Jesus established persevering prayer as an ethical standard in Luke 18.1. Now, paradoxically, ethical moral standards are not enforceable by any human system of jurisprudence. Society can coerce now and in Influence by giving or withholding fellowship, but ethical moral standards are adjudicated or enforced by one's conscience. The impact of your conscience depends on whether it is clear or good, corrupted, guilty, or seared. God put his divine moral standards in our conscience. Now, the enemy seeks to distort or violate those standards. Praying with perseverance is not automatic. Now, you got to get this straight. But an intentional faith-based decision. So as you count the cost, consider the following. One, God's faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. The verse says, God is faithful, but that will not mean anything to you if you don't believe that God exists. Why would you persevere at the throne of grace if you do not believe God exists? The existence of God is critical to the reality of Christianity. If God does not exist, think about this, praying is a useless exercise. Now, Jesus proved that God exists by his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 14, I quote this almost in my sleep, but it says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, however, believing that God exists is a willful personal decision. Those who trust in the Lord are not and will not be ashamed because God exists. David said, In Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. Now, the literal Hebrew rendering is, in waiting, I waited. That is, I stayed waiting long, and at last he came. Now, that's the literal Hebrew. But someone might say, okay, David was a favorite. Can I or others look for any real response from God like David did? The Holy Spirit already anticipated your skepticism and your question because at Psalm at verse 40, at Psalm 40 verse 3 it says, "Many shall see it and shall trust in him." This shows that persevering prayer is a covenant privilege not a monopoly given to one or two, but a charter granted to the body of Christ, the called out ones, the ecclesia, the royal priesthood. Now that includes everybody who has accepted Christ as Savior, by the way. Psalm 102 verse 17 through 18 says, He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a future generation that that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. 
Now, too, here's another reason. God's grace. Grace is for sin. Romans 5.21 says, The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased more. Now, we sin by thought, word, and deed every day. We need God's grace to overcome our besetting sinful nature. Paradoxically, grace is activated when we fail. Romans 7 tells us, If we reside in a mortal body, sin also resides in that body. On top of that, Romans 12.3 indicates each of us has a level of faith, which means that each of us also has a level of doubt. To some degree, each of us is a hypocrite. Each of us have seasons of unsound thinking and or fickle emotions praying every now and then. And for a season, we all grow weary of praying, especially if we are made to wait for an answer. Saul prayed, for example, but he did not hear from God on his timetable. I'm focusing on his timetable. So what did he do? Sought guidance from the witch at Endor, or literally from the enemy. Now, what impact does God's silence, frowns, and seeming denials have on your prayer life? Does it dull the edge of your prayer sword or sharpen it? Do you get mad at God with cursing in your mouth and bitterness in your heart with thoughts of abandoning God, your calling, and prayer? Or does it stir it up or fan in the flame your conviction to trust God and pray faithfully? I got to say this. It is God's grace that enables the desire and the power to do His will. But here we go. Psalm 103, 13 through 14 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him, for He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Now, Jesus said in John 10, verses 27 through 30, that no one can snatch us out of His hands. His hands are metaphor for His grace. Allstate, now we know about Allstate, is known as the good hands people. However, Allstate cannot help you with guilt, filth, and the shame of sin. Allstate can give you some money, but they cannot repair a broken heart, refine a confused mind, or relieve a lamenting spirit. And like all other insurance companies, if you make too many claims, they will drop you. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you, no matter how many times you call on him. Now, consider three God's mercy. Lamentation 3, 22 through 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Psalm 123, 3 through 4 says, Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt we have endured much ridicule from the proud, much contempt from the arrogant. Now, <clears throat> God's mercy is for circumstances and situations, but is closely linked to God's grace. For example, in Psalm 51, David asked for God's mercy regarding his sin, but one could argue that David was not only reflecting on his sin as a moral breakdown, but as a life-threatening situation. Now, let me say it this way. It is foolish to abandon prayer, no matter how egregious your sin or tough the situation. It is not only foolish, but irrational to reject or run from the person and the process that can clear your conscience. 
That person uses counterfeit methods to get no true or lasting relief. Without God, your hope for relief or victory over circumstances or situations from without and anxiety and fear from within will never be satisfied. When you pray, when you do pray, you are lackadaisical in your approach to God and prone to abandon prayer altogether. Why? Because of your doubt or unbelief when God, now think about this again, just like Saul, is not on your timetable. Let me put it this way. Name any profession, sport, or task that a person with a persevering spirit gives up when he or she fails, makes a mistake, or misses the cut. He or she, whoever they are, if they, per, if they have a persevering spirit, absorbs the disappointment, licks their wounds, and regathers themselves, and seeks the advice and counsel of more experienced persons, and tries again. The mercy you think you miss should stir up and refocus your diligence to reach out to God again. Whatever mercy or relief you are going to receive comes from God. So, the question you must consider, now think about this, will God give you mercy if you reject him and his process for obtaining his mercy? God's process is to trust him, put on his armor, stand and pray with all perseverance. God, I, I, I can't speak, I, I, I'm going to just say this. God, for his own reasons, may not immediately respond to temptation and suffering, or so it seems. God is, but now think about this, God is constantly sustaining us, even in our stress. I mean, you still got to have air to breathe, blood still got to run through your veins, you still got to even be alive to even experience what you're experiencing. So think about this. But still, he may not resolve our current situation. In John 11, when Jesus was informed about Lazarus, the disciples that he loved, the disciple that he loved, now think about this now, he did not go to him right away. He waited two days. Jesus went after it was seemingly too late because Lazarus was dead. <clears throat> now, it reminds me of a childhood song from my childhood church. God specializes. That was the name of the song. God specializes. But now, one phrase in that song says, God specializes in things that seem impossible, and he will do what no other power can do. Now, the Apostle Paul is another example had to deal with this dilemma as well. He went to the P. He got a PhD in this. Think about this. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 indicate that Paul had a problem. Now, nobody knows what his problem was. He called it a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan that tormented him. Paul said, now Paul, the apostle Paul, said he went to God three times and asked God to remove it. But here's the deal. Apparently, God said no, that he was not removing the problem, but asserted that his grace was sufficient. Now, the ball was back in Paul's court. Paul's response is a model for perseverance. Paul had to answer this question for himself. Is God's grace sufficient for me? Now, God told him it was. But see, in this case, he had to believe God. What about you? Is God's grace sufficient for you? Or do you believe God? All right, four. Here's something else for you to consider about persevering prayer. <clears throat> God's peace. As I stated earlier, it is foolish not to pray with perseverance. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In this verse, anxiety is tantamount to self-centered, counterproductive worry, not the legitimate cares and concern for the advancement of God's kingdom. Anxiety in the form of worry opposes peace in a believer's life. Now, thanksgiving coupled with persevering prayer is the antidote and most effective weapon against worry. The result is the peace of God. But now I got to throw this in edgewise. Let me say this quickly. That no one can have the peace of God if he or she does not have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace through, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, peace with God means that one has been justified by faith, which means he or she has been declared or reckoned righteous by God. This in included, now, now, when you reckon righteous by God, you are included in Christ because when one believes, he or she is born again or born from above. You receive the Holy Spirit, you are anointed by the Father, and are placed into the body of Christ. That's a whole lot when you believe. Peace with God, now I'm going to say this about that, is not a subjective feeling like peace of mind, but a forensic change in the positional status of the person. You are now in a reconciled relationship with God. The person is no longer, you are no longer an enemy of God, but a child and a friend of God. Again, a person must have peace with God to experience the peace of God. Now, like peace with God, the peace of God is not a psychological state of mind, but a Sabbath rest that Jesus promised to all who come to him. It is the serenity that comes when a believer remembers that his or her sins are forgiven and rests his or her faith on God's power. Persevering in prayer, learning to be content in all circumstances and situations. Now, we're getting there. Finally, prayer is a duty the enemy strongly opposes. The enemy attempts to stir up the fog of spiritual warfare through anxiety, doubt, and fear. Prayer is an activity that not only has the enemy's opposition, but numerous other difficulties that render it no easy matter for the believer to be watchful and persevering. God knows this and gives us the Holy Spirit to help us because of cause imperfection that is included in our morally besetting sinful nature. We have that in us. We have delusional stinking thinking. We have fickle moods and hypocritical emotions and selfish motives, also known as our evil secret desires. And finally, we also have our physical infirmities. All this works together against prayer, especially persevering and watchful prayer. A believer should make or has to make the faith-based decision to persevere in prayer because the Word of God tells us we are not alone against the enemy or all that other stuff I just uh, talked about. The indwelling Holy Spirit is ready to pray in us because we receive the Holy Spirit when we believe. And Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, is ready to pray for us. Both the Holy Spirit and Christ intercede for us. So now is not the time. When you're going through something, now that is not the time to give up on prayer when both Jesus and the Holy Spirit are working in you and for you. Giving up on prayer, i got to say this too, opens the gates of your soul for the enemy to enter 
and shipwreck your faith and bring this honorable reflection on God, which is literally bringing the way of truth in the disrepute. Again, to neglect persevering prayer is foolish. However, it is more consequential not to pray at all. Now, let me, let me go through a couple of those. Anyone who ceases to pray is spiritually insane. I'm going I'm I'm to take, take the covers off and just lay it out there, call a spade a spade. Does anyone demonstrate a sound mind if he or she flees from or rejects being in God's presence? Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, two, cease ceasing to pray. If you cease to pray, let me say it that way, you will begin to sin. Prayer is not only a means to prevail for mercy, but also to prevent sin. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The thief comes, now think about this, the thief comes when the lights are out and people are sleeping. The, the, think about this, now, 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 now if you link that together with this, the disciples could not stay awake in their devotions and they were quickly overcome when the enemy attacked. Doubt and unbelief soften your conviction to resist the reception of sinful impressions from the enemy leading to sins of commission and sins of omission. He, now let me say it, he or she that turns from the truth will turn to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3-5 says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now we're going to stop there. And again, I pray that this study is enriching your life about prayer because it's definitely enriching mine. Now, as we move forward, we will continue in our study of prayer. May God bless and keep. Amen, amen, and amen.